بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد continuing on in our dars may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with with uh, benefit and bless us all with am nafi rizq tayyib wa amal mutaqabbil and may allah tabarak wa ta'ala bless us with ikhlas with thabat as we know that those are the two conditions for our worship for all acts of worship that we have sincerity for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we follow the sunnah of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if we want our deeds to be accepted and we're all aware of the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in al awwal an nas yuqda alayhi yawm al qiyamah rajulun ustushida wa utiya bi fa'rafuhu ni'amu fa'rafaha qala fa ma amata fiha qala ma ma qala qataltu fika hatta ustushida qala kadhabt walakin lakin lakinaka fa'alta li yuqal huwa shaja'un فَقَدْ كِيلْ ثُمَّ أُمِرَ بِهِ فَسُحِبَ لَوَجِهِ حَتْهُ الْقِفِ النَّارِ So we know the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said the first people to be judged on the Day of Judgment are the three. The first one being the one who was martyred. And he was martyred. Uh, he said he claimed he was martyred in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but Allah said that you lied because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala kulli shayin qadir. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala kulli shayin alim. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. Tabaraka wa ta'ala. And His knowledge is infinite. And with that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that His intention was not for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But His intention was to please the people. And so the people were pleased. And He, he was killed and martyred. But in fact, he didn't get shaheed. He didn't get the reward of shaheed, which is alim. But rather, he got the uh, punishment of those people who are will go to the hellfire because he did it for the sake of the people. And then the second one, of course, is the alim or the uh, the person who read the Quran, and then they will be brought before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And again, because of their uh, inadequate int- intention, their intention was not for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It was for the sake of the people. Then they were punished and dragged in the hellfire. And the last one was the one who was given a lot of wealth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they spent it in various kinds of khair and many kind of doing many good things, but they did it for the praise of the people rather than for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a, a, a good opening for us because where we left off in our treaties, uh, the treaties of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, Nawakid al Islam, we were in the first naqid min nawaqid al-Islam, the first nullifier from amongst the nullifiers of faith. And we were talking about, uh, we were coming up to shirk. And as a uh, leading up to shirk, we had to first talk a little bit about tawheed, and which led us to worship, the act of, uh, of of worship or worship and what worship means in Islam. So we will continue on and discussing what is worship. Ma'ana al-ibadah. Al-ibadah alati khalaq Allah laha al-khalq hiya. Ism jami' li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allah wa yardahu min al-aqwali wal-a'mali wa'amali wa so ibadah or worship it is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says I have not created mankind in jinn except for the purpose of worshipping me and Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah says about ibadah about the term ibadah or the concept of ibadah or worship it is a a term which is encompassing and it encompasses everything Allah loves and is pleased with from our statements and our actions which are open and hidden meaning those internal and from the things that are uh, vahir for example uh, reciting the shahid, shahadatain you know saying uh, bearing witness that there's no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
uh, and that Muhammad is the last prophet and messenger. That's the shahadatain. That enters a, fold of, a person into the fold of Islam. That is the miftah al-jinnah. That is the key to paradise. And that is something we do on our tongues. So that is something open. And of course it has an aspect of batan as well because, it, because some of the conditions for the shahada is that we have sidq. That we have ikhlas, we have sincerity, and that we have, we're truthful in uttering the shahada, and we have ilm, we know the meaning. So some of these things are things that are internal, as far as the conditions, as far as the conditions for the shahada, those things are internal. Those are things that the people outwardly cannot tell. They can't tell if you're sincere necessarily. They can't tell if you're uttering the shahada uh, with truthfulness and believing in it. Those things are uh Amur Bataniya, those are issues which are related internally, related to the heart and so forth, that only you and of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully aware of and Allah knows everything subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we mentioned, as Shaykh al-Islam, his statement that the outward things like mentioning the shahadatain, like praying, the Salat, like paying Zakat, like fasting the month of Ramadan, like uh, Hajj, and uh, commanding the good and forbidding the evil, um, and being kind to one's guests and one's neighbors, um, and calling to Allah, giving Dawah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of these things are outward ways, uh, outward forms of Ibadah. And some of the inward that Shaykh al-Islam was mentioning uh, when he mentioned al-Batana, those things which are inside or internal, things like having Iman Billah. No one can tell if you're sincere about your Iman. Someone takes their Shahada, we assume the best. We say, hey, he's into the fold of Islam, he or she is into the fold of Islam, they're Muslim, alhamdulillah. Or you see your uh, Muslim, Muslim brothers and sisters wherever they are, you assume the khair, you assume goodness first and foremost, unlike the Khawarij and some of those other sects which assume the worst first and foremost. And Minbaba B, I just want to mention this, that we also have to be cautious in this in other aspects in our life about assuming having suavan for our brothers and sisters. For example, I've heard of some masajid that the people go to um, and people go and the people look at them with suspicion. SubhanAllah, you're coming to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even if the person was a person of Ahl Bid'ah or something they're coming to your masjid maybe they will maybe they'll be guided from you maybe they'll be guided from your imam speech or the talk or the, the lecture so we shouldn't scare the people away and we should assume the khair we should assume the best about a Muslim uh, so going back to the point is that uh, uh, al-batana, some of these uh, uh, inward acts of, of worship like Iman Billah no one knows if you truly believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala someone takes a shahada maybe they have doubt maybe they uh, you know all those things are between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know those things we cannot uh, determine by their outward uh, necessarily by their outward appearance or the fact that they took their shahada or whatever all of those things uh, the, the pillars of iman are things reserved uh, the, that belief in tu'mina billahi to believe in Allah well that belief is internal to believe in Allah, to believe in the angels, to believe in the books, to believe in the messengers, to believe in the day of judgment, the good, and to believe in the qadr, the good of it and the evil of it. All those things are internal and no one can determine. You can see someone and, and you assume they're on the sunnah and they're this and this and this, but no one knows what's in their heart if they truly believe in Allah or if they truly believe in the angels or if they truly believe in the books that were revealed, uh, the, the, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that was revealed to his uh, prophets, alayhim after or the messengers or the day of judgment maybe they have a naqs I mean I've heard of I've never heard of any any people that are Muslim or you know that associate with themselves with Islam although there are who say things like you know well, you know I'm not really sure if there's a heaven or, or, or hell you know I've heard this from Christians you know people who consider themselves Christians and but they actually have doubt about the day of judgment and you're like well even in your book you know it affirms for you that you know it's always talking about the paradise and the hellfire and the day of judgment these are pillars in Islam these are pillars of Iman 
And so for a person to have doubt in these things, of course that would that would uh, uh, nullify their Islam. And we're going to talk about that when we get to that, um, that aspect in the treaties. And so the point being is those are types of worship that are internal. Also things like khashatillah, uh, you know, being fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having fear, khawf, and khawf, which is another type of fear. And raja, you know, having hope that uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and hope for his blessings and reward. Wahab fillah, and loving someone for the sake of Allah. These are uh, these are internal things, although we can express them externally too. So some types of ibadah, they fall into both categories. Hab fillah, wa bogh fillah, wa ghayri dhalika. And you know, so loving and hating for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are types of worship which are uh, internal. And then, it's very important for us to know that ibadah, when we determine something, if it's a, an uh, act of worship, basically any commandment in the Sharia, uh, the asl of it, meaning the origin of it, is that it's you know any command that comes from Allah or the Prophet sallallahu is wajib, is something that you must do, and it's it's a type of ibadah. This is the origin, and if dalil comes which shows that it is, will show you the different levels of its wujub, or the different levels of its obligation. For example, if, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa aqimu salah wa atu zakat, you know, Allah commands us to establish the prayer, and commands us to pay the zakat. And we don't have any other dalil from the Quran or from the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, which show us that that pay, playing, uh, praying salat is a mustahab that takes it from wajib, being an obligatory action of worship, to change it to something being mustahab or something being mubah. We don't have any dalil for that. Instead, we have a lot of dalil which shows that it's an obligation. And the Prophet Sallallahu said even regarding Salat, Man taraka Salat fakad kafara. Whoever leaves the prayer has disbelief. So that makes it uh, tokit, that gives us tokit, or you know, that it is an obligation for us to pray the uh, Salat, because whoever leaves it has disbelieved, as the Prophet ﷺ said. So that lets us know that that act of worship is uh, an obligation, and that it's an act of ibadah. It is an act of worship. So those are some of the important things, and just uh, from as a faida or a benefit here, bin. Uh, Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala says in his book uh, uh, Asul Min Ilm Asul, which is a book in Asul of Fiqh, when he was talking about the Amr, when, when you determine in Asul of Fiqh when something uh, about a, a command in the Sharia, something a command either from the Quran or from the Sunnah of the Prophet, he said, Al Amr, Qul Yatadamman Talab al Fi'l ala Waj al Ista'la. So he said that the a, a command is a statement which includes uh, the uh, is a statement or like an order to do something which is ala waj al istila meaning that it is from someone who is uh, of higher position to someone who is of lesser position. This is in general. This is the general uh, term. And then he gives an example. He says, Mithil aqimu salat wa atu zakat. He said, like establishing the prayer and uh, paying the zakat. So, of course, when you, uh, and when we were sitting in a dars with our sheikh, and he was mentioning about uh, about this, uh, the importance of, uh, of he gave us some, some good examples. He said, when Ben Othimin says, and Ben Othimin explains it here in his, in his book, as well as in his explanation, ala wajah isti'la, meaning that this is from someone above you 
to lesser status. So the Sheikh gave us some examples. He said, for example, your children are of lesser status. You know, you have a greater respect and greater position, of course, than your children. Your, your children are obedient to you. You're not obedient to your children. So if your children order you, say, Dad, you better not do this. Okay? Maybe in the English language in general, we say he commanded us. But as far as, as a, a term here, a Sharia term, it refers to the one who has the higher status to that which is of lesser status or uh, or has lesser position. So, for example, you cannot say that that would not be considered an emir if the child uh, ordered the parent to do something. Dad, turn off the TV. Dad, would you please uh, bring me something? If he, he commanded you, your child, your son, your daughter, etc. But rather, it's the opposite of way around. You ask your, your son or your daughter, can you please uh, you know, go to your room, do this chore, or uh, you know, behave yourself. Whatever the situation is, this is from your position, which is a higher status, to your child, which your child must respect you. You are not the one to be obedient to your child. Of course, unfortunately, we could debate that. In unfortunately, many of the societies, things are changing rapidly, where it is becoming the other way around, and the child's position is actually uh, becoming greater than the adult. So much so that they can throw the uh, adults in jail if the adult uh, angers them. They can just call 911 and call the police. My father is this. My father threatened me. My father has hit me. He spanked me. Whatever, and they can play it up, and and the father will go to jail. This is the case for us in America now. Will Allah stand? So it shows you that those things are changing. But in general, as far as the Sharia is concerned, when we make talab or when we have an emir, it is from a higher position to a lower position. So getting back to our point is that mentioning, of course, Allah wa Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, they make the command, they command us when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Quran uh, to do something, aqimul salat, that this is Allah wa ta'ala uh, commanding us to pray. And we are nothing, we are insignificant compared to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He commands us, and He created us, and He has the full right to be worshipped by us, that we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh, this was just from Baba Faida that an emr, that a command has different levels. And again, the asl of the command in the Sharia or the origin of the command is that it is an obligation unless Dalil comes from the Quran and the Sunnah, which shows that it is not an obligation that maybe it's mustahab, it's recommended, or that it's not mustahab, that it's mubah, or what have you. And there's many different principles, and this comes under usul of fiqh, which is not our. Uh, a topic that we're discussing. So getting back to what we are discussing about Ibadah and so forth, Ibadah also has different levels and Aqsam al-Ibadah min haith al-wujub wa adamihi. So the different types of worship from the point of being an obligation or the lack of an obligation. Ibadat wajiba. Some of the Ibadat or Worship, which is an obligation, fi'l al wajibat wa tarq al muharamat, which means to do the uh, obligatory deeds and leave off the things that are prohibited. So that it's inclusive of that. That that is a part of ibadah. That is a part of ibadah. What includes ibadah again is fi'l al wajibat is doing the obligation. Wa tarq al muharamat and leaving those things which are prohibited. وَقَجَّا رَجُلُ إِنَّ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَ فَقَالَ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَرَأَيْتَ إِذَا صَلَيْتُ الْمَكْتُوبَاتِ وَصُمْتُ رَمَضَانَ وَحَرَمْتُ الْحَرَامِ وَأَحْلَلْتُ الْحَلَالَ وَلَمْ أَزِدْ عَلَى ذَلِكَ شَيْءٍ أَفَأَدْخُلُ الْجَنَّةَ قَالَ نَعَمْ فَقَالَ وَاللَّهِ لَا أُزِيدُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ شَيْئًا رُوَاهُمْ أَحْمِدُ A beautiful hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and may Allah bless us with fiqh fideen, ameen. So here in this hadith, the Prophet, a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, O Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, if I prayed the 
maktubat, you know, the, the, the obligatory prayers. And I fasted the month of Ramadan. And I prohibited that which is prohibited. And I make lawful or practice that which is lawful. And I don't increase anything. I don't do anything other than that. Will I enter paradise? The Prophet wasallam said, yes. And then the man said, Wallahi, I won't increase upon that anything. And it was collected in Ahmed. So there it shows us the obligatory, some of the obligatory things that we have to do. And that the Sharia uh, calls us and orders us to do. Those, that's some of the ibadat that we have to do, some of the wajib. And... The Shaykh mentions, وَهَذِهِ الْعِبَادَاتِ الْوَاجِبَ هِيَ أَحَبَّ وَتُقَرَّبَ بِهِ الْعَبْدِ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ كَمَا قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فِي الْحَدِيثَ الْقُرْدْسِي وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا أَفْتَرَدَتُ أَفْتَرَدْتُ أَفْتَرَدْتُ Alayhi, Ruahu Bukhari. In this hadith of uh, Hadith Qudsi. So the Shaykh said that this, that the obligatory acts of ibadah are but more beloved and bringing a slave closer to Allah, uh, they're, they're, they're more beloved to Allah and bring the slave closer to Allah, the Almighty, similar to the way the Almighty said in the hadith. Al Qudsi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, My slave does not come closer to me with anything more beloved to me than what I have uh, made an, obliga- uh, an obligation upon him. So this shows us uh, those obligatory duties, uh, some of the things that we need to uh, strive to do, and that ibadah is of. Uh, there are those things which are an obligation and there's those things are mustahab. Some of the ibadat, masnuna uh, uh, or nawafil, those things which are recommended are things like, uh, things that uh, complete your iman. Al-kamal al-mustahab. Or they increase your iman. Things like uh, uh, doing extra prayer. Or uh, and, and and so forth, you know, extra fasting and and you know those things which complete your iman, you know, being good to your your guests and your your neighbors and and so forth and and being kind to your fellow Muslim brothers and sisters and being kind to the people and showing a good example as a Muslim for other people. These things help to complete your iman and help strengthen your iman. Those are extra duties. Those aren't the uh, obligatory duties that you have to do that if you do them are the obligatory duties that are uh, ibadah of course that if you don't do them you will have sin but the nawafu the difference with that and the other type of ibadah these extra uh, deeds that if you leave them you have no sin and so that's also those are also uh, related to usul of fiqh things like uh, the wajib, that you have wajib, you have mandub or mustahab, you have uh, mubah, you have makru, and then you have uh, haram or muharram. So wajib, those acts which are wajib, those acts of ibadah, those things that you have to do, and if you leave them, you will gain a sin. The mustahab are those things that if you do them, you will receive, uh, and also the wajib, you will receive reward for it. You will receive reward for it, and if you leave it, you will get a sin. The mustahab, you will get reward for it if you do it, but if you leave it, there is no sin. The mubah, meaning there's no reward for it, and there's no sin for leaving it, or and there's no uh, sin for doing it. It's mubah. For example, eating an apple is mubah. You don't get reward for it, and you don't get a sin for it. You know, it's just uh, a part of, you know, feeding yourself. But if you eat that apple for the sake of Allah, meaning to to uh, strengthen your body and ibadah, you know, you're breaking your fast with that apple and you're using that apple to come closer to Allah, to gain your strength, and your intention is that, then, then therefore, it can be a wasila to that khair, and it can be an actual act of ibadah where you'll be rewarded for it. Because 
you are doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're doing it so you can better please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and better worship Allah the Almighty. And then uh, uh, then we get to makru, those things which are disliked, meaning that if you leave them, you will be rewarded. And if you, if you do them, there is no sin upon you. And then lastly are those things in Muharram that if you do them, of course you get a sin, and if you leave them, you will be rewarded. And those are just the different uh, ahkam, uh, ahkam in the usul of fiqh, those rulings pertaining to uh, actions and statements and so forth in the Sharia, things that we do, and they are directly related to ibadah because as we said, anything that is a command in general uh, in the Sharia, it is an, a type of worship unless there is Dalil to come to show that it is not an obligation or Dalil to show that it is actually not an act of worship. There are some things and there are examples, but those are things in the usul of fiqh uh, which are not uh, a part of our concern uh, in this uh, this dars. So, uh, worship in Islam, according to Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, is everything that Allah loves and is pleased with, from actions and sayings open and hidden. Worship is also defined as acting upon any commandment of Allah or the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or leaving off or restraining oneself from those things they have prohibited. Uh, for example, and we already mentioned about establishing the prayer and paying the zakat. This verse illustrates the importance of these actions and it contains two commandments, therefore they are considered acts of worship. Allah only commands us to follow those things that please Him and that which pleases Him is considered worship. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, May Allah curse the one who sacrifices to other than him. May Allah curse the one who, cures, uh, who curses his parents. May Allah curse the one who innovates. May Allah curse the one who changes the signposts on the roads. Ruahu Muslim. Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La'an Allah men dhabaha li ghayri la. La'an Allah men la'an waladain. La'an Allah men awa so in this hadith, here the Prophet ﷺ forbids us from certain actions and cursing our parents, things like cursing our parents, and very explicitly warns us that these actions incur Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's wrath. So by staying away from these actions.